As of today, an unnamed but apparently highly placed uh, administration and official is saying that the situation in Sir Syria has uh, moved past the point of no return. And you can expect at some point in the next few days, possibly while we're speaking, some sort of attack will be launched on Syria. We have warships off the coast of Syria right now. The war drums are beating on both sides of the aisle. Now, some people are trying to pump the brakes on Obama's use of military force, and we will talk about that angle. But it looks right now as if there is basically nothing that can stop this barring Russia or China on the Security Council doing whatever they can to stop it. And those negotiations still are ongoing. Um, but we do look like we're going to have a conflict. So what do you guys think about that? Uh, you know, my son and I, we love the trains, okay? And uh, when you get on the train, what do they say? All aboard! And that's exactly where we are now. The train has not left the station, but all aboard, and we're about to go. So you could tell over the weekend, guys, uh, when all the pundits and all of the congressmen and senators that were on TV came out in unison. Someone handed them a memo. We're yeah. going. We're going. And so I've got a, a decent number of issues with it. One is that it's a one-time thing. The Syrians, as John's about to tell us, are already clearing out every installation yeah. we might bomb. Mm -hmm. So it's like one of those drug tests where you, we tell you, you know, a couple of weeks in advance, by the way, we will be testing you, star athlete. Well, Please make sure you get clean <laughs> in these next couple of weeks. The Onion had an awesome headline today. It was, Obama is considering his option in Syria. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah they're, they're not thinking about too many different things they could do, but yeah. Yeah. what do you guys think? I think that, uh, you know, if we actually do go through with this half measure, and that's essentially what it is, it's a half measure, it's a really bad idea, and we have pay, uh, occurrences in the past that prove that it's a bad idea. In 1998, there were two different strikes that we took against um, Saddam Hussein and uh, against um, Osama bin Laden. And in those two cases, it turned out to be a complete and utter disaster, right? Uh, they obviously, the U.S. thought that they were successful. However, it did nothing to stop either one of those people. Like, they still came after the United States. If, if anything, it caused more hostility toward the United States. And at this point in time, Syria is not a threat to the United States. So why are we going to get involved and carry out this half measure? And the reason why I call it a half measure is because there won't be boots on the ground. I'm not even advocating for boots on the ground. But, you know, we're going to launch some missiles and hope that it'll somehow deter Bashar al Assad. It's not going to deter him. So I'm, I'm against it. I don't think we should get involved at all. I, I think the crazy thing here is this has completely unmasked Obama as some sort of anti-war or change the foreign policy of America guy because he is now going to not get authority from Congress. He's going to not get authority from the UN, two things that he attacked Bush relentlessly for. He already did it once in Libya, didn't get authorization from Congress. So he's doing exactly what we expect from our foreign policy, except he's the guy we don't expect it from. So this, this is a really sad moment for anyone that still believes any of the things that Obama said in 2007 and they've systematically been knocked down one at a time. I mean, this is, this is, there's nothing left at this point, I think. Well, so I have an overall conclusion on whether we should go to Syria or not, but it it's related to two things John's about to tell us. So tell us what the Syrian army is doing and telling us what Congress is doing. Yeah, so uh, as expected, Syria is not simply going to wait patiently by until the bombs start dropping, until they see a telltale like drone uh, signature on the radar, I suppose. They are uh, starting to evacuate military assets, uh, leadership, uh, politically, uh, the political leadership assets. We've got a message from uh, Abu Ayham, a commander in the Ansar al-Islam uh, rebel brigade. Is It's one of the defected Syrian generals, is giving us information about the movement of their forces. He says, to all intents and purposes, the Army's command and control compounds have been evacuated. Before the threat of Western strike, they've been taking precautions by working more from lower floors. In the last 48 hours, they have been vacated. And we also have kind of an ominous uh, message from a, a resident of Kafar Soussei, which is a pretty high security area of Damascus. Uh, that, that person said, you can drop a needle in Kafar Soussei and hear it. And so they have done whatever they can to disperse their, their political and military assets, as we would have expected. And as you predicted just last week, we have to imagine they've also dispersed their chemical weapons as well. And so God knows at this point where those are and how they might be deployed in the future. Right. And, and we're saying that we're not necessarily going to hit the chemical weapons. We're just doing this as some say punitive uh, measures. Uh, the official word from Washington is accountability measures okay so it's not necessarily like oh, we're gonna knock out their chemical weapons it's just that since they use them and I made a big political stink about a red line 
that I got to do something, this is what I'm going to do. But doesn't that show you why Obama has been such a failure at this thing? He created the, the red line, and now we're giving them days to literally move all the bad stuff. We can't attack the chemical mm -hmm. weapons, because if you blow up a chemical weapons depot, well, then chemical weapons can be spread all over the place. And we're now allowing them to move people, move assets, everything that's important that will eventually they'll be able to continue the war with. Well, we're going to bomb away. We'll bomb some buildings for a couple of days. I mean, it really, it, it shows you the, the lack of foresight of the administration. Yeah, but I think, to, to be fair, just to directly address that, I, I mean, it's certainly fair to say we're giving them warning, and that's true, but we're also criticizing him for not interfacing enough with both the, the domestic political leadership and also with the UN. Like, we can't really have both of those. Either he attacks instantaneously without forecasting what he's doing, or he does the diplomacy. And, and but we, he's doing we may neither. not. He's well, doing neither. We, he's we neither. may believe, and probably accurately so, that in the end he's not going to require congressional authorization or UN authorization. But they are talking with the different members of the Security Council. He has been, he wrote a letter to Congress. Now, he may not, at, in the end, actually care what they have to say, but that ha this time that we've been experiencing the last few days has been spent at least with fake diplomacy, if nothing else. When it comes to Syria, there's a lot of debate about exactly what measures Obama can take on his own or what measures he should wait for congressional approval on. And so at least 82 House members, and this number has been going up throughout the day, including at least 13 Democrats, have, si have written and signed a letter to President Obama basically saying that he would be violating the Constitution if he attacks Syria without their approval. Uh, some of the, the text of the, of the message that they sent to Obama says, Engaging our military in Syria when no direct threat to the United States exists and without prior congressional authorization would violate the separation of powers that is clearly delineated in the Constitution. Uh, and then they go, later go on to say that if you deem that military action in Syria is necessary, Congress can reconvene at your convenience. And now just to put this in a bit of historical context, if, we're, if we were to go back to 2007, Barack Obama has previously talked about the use of unilateral executive power in waging war. He said then, uh, the president does not have power under the Constitution to unilaterally authorize a military attack in a situation that does not involve stopping an actual or imminent threat. Now, he doesn't say an actual or imminent threat to the United States. Maybe that's the wiggle room that he has because it is an actual or imminent threat to, I suppose, the rebels and the civilians of Syria. All right. So, first of all, uh, I have been vacillating on this issue for the entire time of the Syrian civil war. I think it's an incredibly hard issue. I think it's totally be okay to be on either side of it. It is, and just last week I was saying I was 51% in favor of uh, taking some action against the rebels. Uh, but I have now reached a definitive conclusion one day before the bombing begins. Okay, and I, and I partly do this because I don't like being a Monday morning quarterback. I like you know, talking about things before they happen. So it's constructive criticism. What should we do mm -hmm. before we actually take the action? And so, uh, I, I, I'm pained by what Assad has done, and, and I, uh, you know, you see the chemical attacks, we've shown them, and you see the kids there, lifeless, and it's just gut-wrenching, et cetera. That's why I was at 51%. But I've concluded that we're going about this the wrong way. So number one, President Obama had all the time in the world to ask for congressional authorization. And back when, it was, when he was not president and he wanted to criticize President Bush, rightly so, he said, you absolutely need congressional authorization. Now, in Libya, he didn't get it. And I thought I was in favor of the Libya action, which put me at odds with a lot of progressives in the country. But again, there, I thought, why not get congressional authorization? And look, I'm in favor of the action. But if the Congress doesn't agree, then apparently the American people don't agree. Sad day. You live in a democracy. Syria is a perfect example of that. If the American people don't agree, well, sad day for me that I don't get to do my position because I'm not the king of America. I'm the president, you know, in his case, I would be the president of, the, of America, and I need to go through what the Constitution demands, right? And there's just no excuse for it, because there is no imminent threat. Go ahead, Jeff. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's totally true. Uh, let, let me give the, the opposite side of it, just, just uh, before we, we continue debating it. Um, this isn't a person, a politician, that I don't usually like to be on the same side of an issue with, but we have Peter King, he was speaking about this issue on Fox News. Let's listen to him. He has the right to act without authority. Yeah, presidents have done Stack this consistently. Uh, President Reagan did it in Grenada. President Eisenhower did it in Lebanon. As commander-in-chief, he has the right to begin military actions. Now, if he's smart, he would certainly consult with the House and Senate leaders, with the members of the, or the uh, top people on the Intelligence Committee, the Armed Services Committee, uh, the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. But he doesn't have to. As commander-in-chief, I believe strongly the president has the constitutional right to carry this out. So it's really two different issues. One, he has the right to do it. But secondly, I think he'd be very smart to consult with the leadership, not with all of Congress. 
Now, P Peter King's a horrible guy, but I think that he is right in both areas of that. Like, it, it's bad, I think, that the president has the established authority to wage some sort of limited military conflict before then, after, within two months, having to come back under the War Powers Act. But that is the, the precedent that has been set historically. And I don't see why a Democratic president should be held to some dif different standard than a Republican president. And I don't think that Iraq is a similar situation. An invasion, a ground invasion of a country is, I think, very different than airstrikes. Okay. But uh, if, we, if Canada was to lob rockets into America, I'm pretty sure we would all consider it an act of war. So I would certainly understand if Syria or the international community thought, oh, we parked a couple of boats in the Mediterranean and launched a couple of cruise missiles. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with an act of war on that one. So our, our level of hypocrisy and, you know, for the related to the Libya thing, Obama already did this one. So Peter King's right. Sure, Reagan did it. But that's not just the precedent. There's a precedent in this administration, which is that Obama has already attacked a country without congressional authority. So that, that goes to my second point. John, I understand what you're saying. You're right. We have been violating the Constitution <laughs> for all these decades. I'd like well, to get back to following yeah, this. I, 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 don't, I don't think that it's necessarily violating the Constitution. Uh -huh. I think that, that in that area, when you talk in the Constitution about him being commander-in-chief, exactly what the bounds of that are is something that is up for philosophical and legal debate. And it I, has well, been for hundreds of years. Argument, wouldn't you make the argument that uh, you know Obama can act unilaterally without dealing with Congress at all if Syria poses an imminent it, yeah. threat to the United that, States. Well, they we're don't. referencing a quote that Barack Obama said in 2007. Now, he's a constitutional scholar in some senses, but he is not the arbiter of what really the he's been really good about, you know, no, no, I understand that. the What I'm saying is simply yeah. because he said that in his quote does not mean that that is the constitutional like, No, but doesn't the War Powers passed. Act say it has to be an imminent threat? It's not Obama's words. The actual War Powers Act and the separation of powers says that it has to be an imminent threat. So I, I've studied the War Powers Act, but it's been a number of years, so I don't know the actual. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it's not what, just it. what he's saying. Yeah, no, I understand that, and and he is being a giant hypocrite about this. A, and by the way, in in their uh, talk about this, the White House is saying, no, no, it's an imminent threat because it's a future threat. <laughs> no, that would be a future <laughs> threat, no, not will, an imminent threat it, it by will, definition. If right. anything, it will become an imminent threat if you intervene, if you get involved and you launch missiles. That's when it becomes an so, imminent threat. So, so let me go to the second point on, on all yeah. on all of the things that you guys are mentioning here. Uh, listen, if if we were not hypocritical and we were consistent. I would be in favor of this. And here's what I mean by that. To go to the point of the Syrian army clearing out all the buildings so they don't have to worry about anything, I, after I had cleared it with the United States Congress and to our, with our allies to the best of our abilities, I understand that Russia and China might not sign on, but I would at least want to get a large percentage of the Arab League to sign on because we're going into their backyard, etc., and they have not, right? So there's a significant problem with the coalition, and it's beginning to look like the coalition of the willing which we did under Bush with Iraq, which was a disaster and a joke, right? So we don't have good international support either, or enough international support in this case. Uh, but if we did, I would say, look, here's our, here's our precedent that we're laying down, and here's the rule we're laying down. If you use weapons of mass destruction, we're going to come to get you. We're going to build a coalition, we're going to go through Congress, and once we've decided, we're not going to give you fair warning. You use it, we're going to hit you, okay? And we're going to hit you consistently. It's not a one-time thing. We're not going to tell you we're coming on Thursday, okay? <laughs> so you can clear out the buildings. You're going to live in a state that you have put your civilians under, which is constant worry, when am I going to get hit, okay? So that's a precedent that I would love, because I actually, I'm more interventionist than most liberals, than most progressives, and, and certainly more than libertarians. I believe that, you know, it's a good thing when we push for human rights. I also believe it's a good thing when we protect civilians from weapons of mass destruction, et cetera. Now, we have not in the past. I just did a story this week about how we gave Saddam basically the green light to use chemical weapons against Iran. Okay? Reagan did that, you know, and he said, yeah, go for it, because Iran winning was unacceptable, right? Mm -hmm. So we've been giant hypocrites, hypocrites about it in the past. doesn't mean we have to be mm -hmm. in the future. Now, as we are doing this attack, we're not doing any of that. We haven't gotten the coalition. We haven't gotten the authorization from Congress. And we're it, it, indicating to them, we're going to come for only this limited time. You guys clear out the buildings. And what we're doing is we're lighting a match 
without good follow-up and good strategy. And you don't know what happens when you light a match. When you light a match, you have to be inordinately careful. Doesn't mean you shouldn't light one, okay? But you have to be really careful. So how is Syria going to counterattack? For example, they could counterattack an act of war, as Dave said, by attacking a NATO ally. The second largest uh, army in NATO is Turkey, sitting right there next to them on their border. What if they start launching bombs into Turkey? And then Turkey says, I'm a NATO ally, I gotta go. They're hitting me with bombs. US, you gotta come with me. Now what are we going to do? Now we have Well, a then suddenly we need congressional authorization because it must be a war, right? <laughs> right? I mean, that's the problem. That's the real problem. They've already said, Syria has already said, we will attack Israel and Jordan if this happens. Well, you do that, pretty sure they're going to hit back. And, and then you've, you've created, dare I say, Glenn Beck might be right, you really could create the slippery slope into World War III with this thing. I really believe it's that uh, catastrophic. So I don't know if this is the match that lights that fire. But that fire is brewing yeah, and is. brewing in the Middle East, and I'm scared to death of it. So if you had a really well thought out strategy and a way to try to protect people in the long run, and we'd been sticking with it for decades and we wanted to continue it today, I would be in favor of it. But we have not stuck with it for decades. We say we're not going to stick with it going forward. So then this is a really poorly thought out plan mm -hmm. that I'm officially against.